Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video, we're going to talk about precipitation titrations. We're going to start by reviewing the principles of titration. We're going to look at the different types of titration that exist to kind of put things in context. We're then going to look at how precipitation, precipitation titrations, say that 10 times fast, how do they actually work? We're going to look at the different types of kind of variations of precipitation titrations um, and kind of go through each one in turn. And then we're going to be able to spend some time kind of comparing precipitation titrations versus traditional kind of acid-based titrations that you might be more familiar with. So let's have a quick look at, remind ourselves of the principles of titration or volumetric analysis, kind of the, the, the other alternative name, that we're using a chemical reaction between two substances to help quantify or determine the concentration of an unknown one by reacting it with a, another substance, a reactant, with a known concentration. So we're using something that we do know to react with something that we don't know in order to not just identify what it is, but to quantify or determine its concentration, its solubility, or some, some numerical value about it. Okay, so we, we're typ typically using this sort of equipment, a, a burette and a conical flask. So one reactant is in one place, the other reactant is in the other place. I realise that here they're labelled as acids and bases, but we can think more broadly than that now. And we use a pipette to transfer a known amount of one reactant into the flask. As we add reactant from the burette into the conical flask, we get to a point in which we, something tells us to stop, and then we use the values of the, the volumes that we have there to help determine the concentration. And here's kind of a, a photo of what that looks like. Okay, we're all, at, by this point, very familiar with titration, um, probably to the point of, of frustration even. You've done it so much sometimes. But now we're going to see how this is a specific example. So the one that you're probably most familiar with is an acid-base titration or a neutralization titration, where we're looking at an acid and a base and using that sort of reaction. But some of the other titrations, other types of chemical reactions we can base this on include a redox reaction. Um, we can also look at what's called complexometric titrations, where we're forming a complex ion, and also then precipitation. Um, these are kind of the four main types that we might encounter as chemists. Um, but it's still using that same principle of reacting a known substance with an unknown one. But as to how that reaction looks, what type of reaction it is, we see there's some variation. So how does a precipitation titration actually work? What, what is it specifically about this technique that makes it useful for us? Well, you can see here some photos of the three different types of, of these, this sort of reaction we're going to go through in a moment. But it's essentially the idea of formation, the formation of a precipitate to help quantify the thing we're looking for, the analyte. So rather than neutralization, like in acid and base, that we're looking at uh, the formation of a specific amount of precipitate. Um, so yeah, typically we're looking at it using the reaction between silver ions and halide ions like chloride, bromide, or iodide. Um, because we know that silver, chloride, bromide, and iodide are insoluble. And so as we add silver into a solution with chloride ions or vice versa, that then we'll get a precipitate that forms. And but so then, um, and, and as a result, because we're using silver in each of these examples, that they're sometimes known as, or alternatively known as, argentometric titrations, because argentum being the Latin for silver, where the symbol AG comes from. So we're, because it's silver is the kind of key ingredient that we're looking at here, that's where that name arises. So there's three different types or variations of this type of titration. Um, the first one is called the Moore method. Um, so we're going to go through some of the specifics about each of these techniques. Uh, the Moore method involves a neutral medium, so a neutral solution that we're putting silver nitrate in the burette. That is, it's, it's called the titrant. The thing that's added from the burette is the titrant. So silver nitrate is added into a solution that's got the halide ions in it. We use potassium chromate as a compound in the dissolved in the flask as an indicator. The reason that it works is so we get the silver halide precipitate that forms, but once we've reached the equivalence point and we're adding excess silver ions, we get a reddish brown silver chromate precipitate because it's highly insoluble. So the sil excess silver ions that we've added now form this reddish brown pre extra precipitate. So the reaction goes from the formation of a white precipitate to then this additional colour, which is the, the, the thing that we look for. Um, and so you can see kind of the three different stages of a titration. So this is a set up and ready to go. So we've got the chloride ions with the chromate in there as an indicator, our titrant, 
Um, where as the titration is in progress and silver ions are draining out of the burette, we get this formation of the precipitate, but we've still got excess chloride ions remaining. We're not done yet. But as soon as we've reached that equivalence point, we have excess silver, we get a colour change. And they're forming that reddish-brown silver chromate colour. The next technique, or the next variation, is called the Volhard method. So it's very similar, but instead we're doing this in an acidic solution. Um, or, or it's a pro particularly useful for acidic solutions. So in this situation, it's a back titration. That is, we're adding a known excess silver nitrate directly to, into the flask, and then we're, we're, we're going to get a precipitate that forms, and we're detecting the excess silver by reacting it with potassium thiocyanate. Okay, because silver thiocyanate is a, um, forms a precipitate. Okay, we use this compound called ammonium iron 3 sulfate, um, as an indicator. It's a source of Fe3 plus ions. That's the, the particularly relevant bit. So we've, we've added a known excess of silver, some of which has been used to make the silver chloride or halide precipitate. The excess silver ions, we've added thiocyanate, and so, and which, which forms this extra precipitate. And then we get to a certain moment when all the silver is precipitated, we add that excess little bit of thiocyanate, SCN minus, we get a red I, Fe you know, thiocyanate um, complex iron. So it goes from this yellowy kind of colour with a white precipitate to bang this this kind of reddish um, tinge that develops in the flask. Okay, so as soon as we've hit that point. Um, the last technique is called the Vagens method, um, so which was developed more recently um, in, in the 1920s. The previous ones were in the 1800s. It involves, a, again, a neutral medium, but instead of, uh, and silver nitrate, but instead of a precipitation or a complex reaction, that we actually use a coloured dye, so dichlorofluorescein, um, which is anionic, so it's negatively charged um, dye, and it, it's essentially an it was called an adsorption technique, with a D, not a B, adsorption. So what happens is that the anionic dye, so so we get the silver chloride precipitate that forms at the bottom, and then there's excess chloride ions that still stick to the outside and they push away the anionic dye molecules. Okay, so these chloride ions are kind of stuck to the outside and then um, push away the dye molecules so they stay in solution. But as soon as we've used up all those chloride ions, we now add a little excess of silver, which then, it then sticks to the outside and it adsorbs or attracts that anionic dye. Um, so instead of being pushed away, it's now pulled towards the precipitate and we go from a greenish yellow color when it's dissolved in solution to a pink color when it's adsorbed. So it's just how that color is actually generated and how that color change develops, which is the, the difference here. But obviously they had to develop and identify this, this dye before it could actually be used in this technique, which is why it's a slightly more recent um, technique. Now, we have these three different techniques that apply in, in different situations or different circumstances, depending on what other kind of ions might be around, So, um, it, it, or what ones we're trying, trying to detect. So it's just different options available to us that might be useful. So let's compare side by side with our acid-base titrations, okay, which are, are more the ones you're familiar with. So acid-base, we're determining the concentration of an acid or a base. Precipitation, we're looking at halide ions, chloride, bromide, iodide. We've got a neutralization reaction between hydronium and hydroxide ions, or we're talking precipitation with silver ions, okay, and the formation of that cloudy, insoluble compound. We can determine the equivalence point with some different techniques. Um, with acid base titrations, we're using an acid base indicator like phenolphthalein or litmus, methyl orange, methyl red, or bromothymol blue. Okay, a colour change as the pH changes. We can also monitor the pH changes using a pH probe or electrode. And we can also measure changes in conductivity, um, which can help us to identify the equivalence point. Um, we've got some slightly different techniques that we'd use for precipitation. So whether it's the formation of a second coloured precipitate, our silver chromide in the Moore method, the formation of a coloured complex ion um, in our Volhard method, or um, also in the, the dye in the Fagens method, but also conductivity measurements can be useful because we see that conductivity starts high at the beginning and it drops as we form that precipitate because um, we're removing ions in solution to make a precipitate. As soon as we hit the equivalence point, the conductivity starts to uh, rapidly increase again. Um, we haven't really gone through that in, in great detail um, beyond just now, but to, to, to recognise that there are different techniques that we can use to identify um, the, the data that we need from the titration.
Okay, so we looked at, reminded ourselves of the principles of titration. We looked at different types of titrations to help put precipitation in context. We looked at how precipitation, precip still struggling, precipitation titrations, how they actually work. We looked at the three different methods or types of precipitation titrations, and then we compared them with the acid-based titrations that we're more familiar with. All right, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.